Have you ever felt like you're just drowning in information? You know, trying to find those key insights, the things that really make you feel well-informed? It's tough, right? Especially with something as complex as financial markets. Today, we're doing a deep dive into asset pricing. And we're focusing on a really cutting-edge idea, something that might fundamentally change how you think about risk and return. See, historically, we've mostly focused on priced risks. Those are the risks investors expect to get paid for taking. But here's the kicker we're exploring today. What if a big chunk of the risk in some investments is actually unpriced? Exactly. Meaning it doesn't add anything to your expected return, but it absolutely adds to your volatility. So it just drags down performance silently. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So our mission today is to unpack these unpriced risks. What are they? Why are they seemingly everywhere? And maybe most importantly, how are top researchers figuring out ways to spot them, maybe even hedge them out to boost efficiency? And we're basing this on some really foundational work, particularly a paper by Chernoff, Dahlquist, and Lockstor, plus some related cutting-edge studies. Great, so get ready, because this might just shift how you look at financial risk. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Right, let's set the scene a bit. When we talk asset pricing, we're trying to figure out why investments give certain returns. For ages, simpler models like CAPM, the Capital Asset Pricing Model, were the main game in town. They were, yeah. But they turned out to be, well, insufficient. They just couldn't explain the complexities we see in the real world. So researchers needed something else. Exactly. They pivoted towards what are called characteristic-based factors. It's a more practical approach. Instead of trying to predict every single stock, you group assets by common traits like company size, value metrics, momentum. Things like that. Right. And there are good reasons for this shift. One, it tackles the huge dimensionality problem, you know, dealing with thousands of assets versus maybe a dozen factors. Much easier. Makes sense. Two, those single factor models like CAPM, they just weren't capturing the full picture of risk premiums. And three, these characteristic based portfolios. They seem to be better at actually capturing the priced risks, the risks investors get compensated for. So it's like focusing on the main currents instead of every tiny ripple. That's a great analogy, yeah. But even with these factors, there's still this theoretical ideal, isn't there? A kind of gold standard benchmark. Ah, uh, yes. You're talking about the mean variance efficient portfolio, the MVE. That's the theoretical holy grail. It's the portfolio that gives you the absolute maximum expected return for a given level of risk. Or, looking at it the other way, the minimum risk for a given return. And it prices everything perfectly. In theory, yes. It sits on what we call the efficient frontier, the ultimate goal. The big challenge, though, is actually building it in practice. Okay, so if MVE is the, let's say, the North Star, but it's hard to reach, where do these practical characteristic factors fall short? And I guess this is where unpriced risk really enters the picture, right? Precisely. This is the core idea. Unpriced components are these parts of a factor's return, even a well-known factor, that have zero expected excess return. None. But they still add to its volatility. Okay, unpack that. Give us an analogy, maybe. Think of a sailboat. The wind in the sails. That's your price component moving you forward. Good stuff. But imagine there's also this, like, invisible anchor dragging underneath the boat. It adds drag, slows you down, makes the ride bumpier but contributes nothing to your forward speed. That's the unpriced component. Got it. So it hurts your efficiency. Exactly. Look at the sharp ratio. It's your expected return divided by your volatility, right? Right. Return over risk. So this unpriced anchor, it increases the denominator volatility, the risk without adding anything to the numerator, the return. Mm -hmm. What does that do? It pushes your sharp ratio down. It depresses it. Okay. I see. And the research visualizes this. It does. Figure one in the paper is helpful here. Imagine individual stocks are just scattered points red circles, low efficiency. Then you form these characteristic portfolios, the blue squares, better, more diversified, higher sharp ratios. But then, and this is the key, you take those same blue squares and hedge out the unpriced risk. They become green diamonds. 
and you see a big jump up towards efficiency. They get much closer to that purple star, which is the MVE sitting right on the efficient frontier with no unpriced risk at all. Wow. Okay, so this isn't just theoretical. This has real implications for anyone trying to understand financial data or build a portfolio. It means if you could somehow strip out that unpriced volatility, you could potentially significantly increase your portfolio's efficiency, get more return for the risk you're taking. So how big an impact are we talking? Is this a minor tweak or something substantial? Oh, it's substantial, really substantial. Empirically, the research suggests unpriced risks account for, get this, 30% to 99% of the variance in factor returns, depending on the asset class and factor. 99%, wow. Yeah, it can be huge. And the flip side is hedging this stuff out can potentially more than double sharp ratio in some cases. For equities, just hedging the market portfolio took its sharp ratio from about 0.4 up to 0.6 and a long short strategy based on expected returns. Its sharp ratio went from 0.84 to, wait for it, 2.31 after hedging. Okay, that's a massive jump. It is. Currencies, the dollar portfolio, basically an average of exchange rates, turned out to have nearly 99% unpriced risk. Hedging boosted its sharp from 0.3 to 0.9. Tripled it. Yep. Sovereign bonds. Similar story. An equal-weighted portfolio had 93% unpriced risk. Hedging took the sharp from 0.5 up to 1.3. These numbers are really compelling. It suggests there's a lot of inefficiency just hiding in plain sight. That's exactly what the research is pointing towards. You might be thinking, okay, if the MVE is so great, why not just estimate it directly? Why bother with factors and hedging? Yeah, that seems like the logical question. The problem is scale and complexity. Think about U.S. equities. You've got, what, maybe 12,000 stocks? Roughly, yeah. Trying to estimate the conditional covariance matrix for all of those how they all move together under different conditions, and then trying to forecast each individual stock's return, it's incredibly difficult, computationally intense, prone to estimation error. Just too much noise. Way too much noise. Yeah. And the dimensionality is just overwhelming. That's precisely why researchers fell back on those characteristic-based portfolios. Right. They were seen as the practical, achievable, next best thing. Okay, so given those challenges, especially in big markets like equities, how do researchers actually try to get rid of this unpriced drag? You mentioned two main paths. Right. It kind of depends on the asset class. Path one is direct MVE estimation, but only when it's actually feasible. And when is that? Usually in asset classes with fewer assets to track and where you have pretty strong signals to predict returns and risk. Think currencies. G10 exchange rates, for example. There aren't that many, maybe nine or 10 relative to the dollar. And there's a decent economic structure to work with. Things like interest rate differences, deviations from purchasing power parity, suggesting mean reversion, maybe some trend following. These give you clues about conditional means. So you have reliable predictors. Relatively reliable, yes. Mm -hmm. And estimating conditional variance isn't too bad either. You can use daily data to get monthly realized variance, look at recent correlations. So Chernoff, Dahlquist, and Lockstor in that 2025 paper show how you can use standard econometric tools to estimate the conditional mean, variance, and correlations and actually build a candidate MVE portfolio. And sovereign bonds, too, you mentioned. Similar logic applies there for G10 government bonds. You can use predictors like the forward spread, the real bond yield. And how do they know if they actually found the real MVE? Ah, good question. They have to test it. There's a statistical test called the Gibbons, Ross, and Shankin test, the GRS test. It basically checks if the portfolio they constructed could statistically be the one with the maximal sharp ratio among all possible combinations of those assets. And did these currency and bond MVEs pass? They did, yeah. The estimated portfolios for currencies and sovereign bonds passed the GRS test, giving strong support that they are, in fact, close to the true MVE for those specific universes. Okay, that's path one, direct MVE when possible. What about path two for things like equities where it's just too complex? Right, that's path two, constructing hedge portfolios. Since you can't easily build the MVE directly, the goal shifts. You take your existing characteristic base factors, value, momentum, whatever, and you try to surgically remove the unpriced junk from them. Like noise cancellation? Exactly like noise cancellation. That's a perfect analogy. You build specific hedge portfolios designed to capture only that contaminating component, the part of the risk that has zero expected return. Then you use that hedge portfolio to neutralize the unpriced risk in your main factor portfolio. How do they build these hedge portfolios? Sounds tricky. There are a few different methodologies researchers are exploring. Some look at how covariances relate to characteristics. Daniel, Moda, Rodke, and Santos proposed a clever double sorting method 
sorting stocks first on a characteristic, then on their covariance with that characteristic factor to try and isolate the unpriced bit. Others, like Herskovich, Marrera, and Muir, use single sorting on betas relative to certain factors. And Lopez Lira and Rusinov use something called IPCA instrumented principal components analysis to find hidden common factors that, it turns out, have almost no risk premium. Hedging those out also boosts sharp ratios. So lots of different techniques aiming for the same goal. Pretty much. It's an active area of research. Now, it's important to mention a limitation here. While this hedging approach definitely improves the sharp ratio of the original factor portfolio, it usually doesn't get you all the way to the true MVE. It gets you closer, maybe much closer, but probably not all the way there. Okay, let's unpack this further. So these different methods, whether it's directly estimating the MV where you can or building these clever hedge portfolios where you can't, they're all driving at the same thing, identifying and neutralizing that unpriced risk, that dead weight dragging down performance. Precisely. It's about making investment strategies more efficient by focusing purely on the compensated risks. We've covered the theory, the why, and the how. But let's talk brass tacks. Does this unpriced risk really show up consistently in the data? What's the empirical proof? Oh, absolutely. The empirical evidence is, frankly, quite stark across the board. It's mm. not just a theoretical curiosity. It's very real. The research, especially using the figures you mentioned earlier, shows just how pervasive this is. Remember figure two. It quantifies the fraction of risk that's unpriced. For U.S. equities, depending on the factor, it was anywhere from about 29% for something like CMA conservative minus aggressive investment factor, okay, all the way up to 90% for that long short portfolio based purely on expected return forecasts. 90% of its risk was apparently uncompensated. 90%, that's huge. It is. Now look at currencies, figure 2B, even bigger numbers there. It ranged from 72% for a cross-sectional carry strategy up to 99% for a one-month time series momentum strategy. 99% unpriced risk. So basically all the volatility was just noise. Almost all of it, Good. according to these estimates, yeah. And remember the dollar portfolio, yeah. also 99%. Incredible. And bonds. Bonds, figure 2C, showed similar large magnitudes. Around 85% for strategies like cross-sectional carry or time series value, up to 96% for a 12-month momentum strategy the unpriced component is consistently large. So the risk is there. What about the payoff from hedging it? Figure three showed the sharp ratio improvements, right? Exactly. That's the other side of the coin. Hedging this stuff out pays off significantly. Back to equities, figure 3A. The price component of that CMA factor had a sharp ratio of 0.55 compared to 0 0.40 for the unhedged factor. A nice improvement. But that long short portfolio, we mentioned it before, jumped from 0.84 to 2.31. That's just a night and day difference. Definitely. Currencies, figure 3B. Cross-sectional carry went from a sharp of 0.71 to 1.29. The dollar strategy tripled its sharp from 0.3 to 0.9. And bonds, figure 3C. Average carry strategy improved from 0.62 to 1.08. Across the board, hedging leads to substantial gains in risk-adjusted performance. These aren't just marginal gains. These are economically significant improvements. It really changes the potential efficiency you can get from these strategies. Oh, it absolutely does. It suggests that a lot of what we traditionally measure as factor volatility might just be noise that can potentially be managed or removed. It's like finding this hidden inefficiency dial you can tune. That's a good way to put it. And researchers are starting to dig into why these unpriced risks are so large. What causes them? There are conjectures, of course. In equities, some research points towards industry risks being a big source of unpriced variation within factors. Okay, like tech stocks moving together for reasons unrelated to, say, the value factor itself. Sort of, yeah. Or maybe energy stocks, that kind of thing. In currencies, the thinking leans towards geographical risks playing a similar role. Maybe European currencies moving together or commodity currencies. Plausible sources. They are. But interestingly, the studies also suggest these aren't the only sources. It seems more complex than just industry or geography. Which means more research needed. Definitely. It opens up avenues to understand market structures better and potentially find even more refined ways to hedge these risks. There's still a lot to uncover about where this dead weight actually comes from. So wrapping things up, we've taken quite a journey into the world of unpriced risks in asset pricing. We set out to understand what these hidden risks are, why they matter so much, and how the leading edge of finance is trying to move towards a, well, a much more efficient view of markets. And the core takeaway really is that this mean variance efficient portfolio, the MVE, remains the theoretical benchmark, the gold standard. Mm -hmm. If you're in an asset class where direct estimation is feasible, like maybe G10 currencies or bonds, the research suggests that's the path to pursue. 
But for most areas, like broad equity markets, the practical implication is that proactively identifying and hedging out these unpriced risks from your factor strategies is crucial. Why crucial? What's the ultimate benefit? Because at the end of the day, it leads to a more accurate pricing of assets. You get a clearer picture of what economic shocks are truly driving the risk premiums that investors demand. It strips away the noise. Leaving you with just the signal. Exactly. Pure signals, more efficient portfolios. Okay, great. So to leave our listeners with something to think about. Yeah, this research really opens up a fascinating question, I think. We talked about industry and geography as potential sources of unpriced risk, but they aren't the whole story. So th the provocative thought might be, what other factors, what other hidden dimensions of risk might be acting as these unpriced components in asset returns just waiting to be discovered and potentially hedged away? 